economic output in the European Union rose by 0.3% in the first three months of 2023, compared to the previous quarter, according to initial estimates. It means that Europe's economy avoided a recession over the winter, slightly picking up pace. But how do we feel in the beginning of this year? How are we doing? And can it be measured by a simple quarterly percentage change that we're used to hearing in the news? Welcome to Euronews Debates. We are going to be covering all of that and more in this edition. But before we go over any of this, here's how our economies are normally measured, but also how they could be in the future. Economic growth. It's a term often bandied around by politicians. But what does it actually mean? Put simply, it's how much a country's economy increases or decreases in size over a period of time. It can be either positive or negative. It's usually measured by something called gross domestic product, otherwise known as GDP. The idea is to reflect the value of all goods and services produced within an economy, a key indicator of its general health. But what if we flipped this idea and economic model on its head and moved beyond growth? This would be something quite different indeed. For starters, not using GDP is the main way to achieve economic policy objectives also mean living within our means and not constantly growing at an unsustainable rate. How does such a big change go about happening though, you might ask? That's a question Europe's policymakers and experts are looking to answer. And this is what we're going to be discussing with Philip Lombard's Greens co-president. Uh, Olivier de Schutte, your special rapporteur on extreme poverty and human rights. Adelaide Charlier, climate justice and human rights activist. And Sandrine dixon Declerve, co-president of the Club of Rome and author right before the Beyond Growth 2023 conference. Let's start with you, Philippe Lombard. Uh, what is the core of this problem and what should be the concept of growth in 2023? Well, the thing is that this planet can be measured. That means it has limits. And uh, economic policy has been, uh, has been operating in a, in a world, a sort of fantasy, that pretends that this planet is unlimited in resources. It is a dustbin of unlimited size. It is a pool of, uh, yeah, of resources that you can exploit without end. And actually, this is just denial of reality. And if we want human beings to live a decent life and not just a happy few, uh, well, then we need to take into account those limits uh, in our economic policy. And that's, that is the crucial question in the 21st century. We are 8 billion now on this planet, looking at 9, 10, maybe 11. Uh, if you want to make room for everyone, you need to start uh, realizing that we need to operate within, uh, within boundaries. Otherwise, humanity will fade away or disappear more brutally. Uh, Olivier, another important aspect here of some of these policies, uh, how they're hurting the poorest in society and why focus should be reducing on, on reducing inequality rather than on increasing GDP. Indeed, it's important to realise that the growth of GDP means very little to people in poverty when they do not benefit from, from such uh, general economic progress, particularly in a context in which, uh, in the name of increasing GDP, inequalities are being increased. In the name of growing the economy, we are liberalizing trade, we are creating a business-friendly uh, investment climate, which means basically reducing taxation on, on large corporations. We uh, privatize the commons on which many people uh, depend. In other terms, we have uh, tried to pursue growth at all costs, particularly at the cost of people living in poverty. So they have much to benefit from this discussion about the kind of development we need and whether we still need to use GDP growth as the compass for future development. Adelaide, let's look at the other perspective. Why is this concept so present uh, in a debate about young generation when it comes to rethinking the economic growth? When you look at the uh, part of the younger generation that has stood up and now has been engaged for quite a while around climate justice aspects, we see that when we go to the core of our demands, we actually need a change in order, like you were saying, to stay within the planetary boundaries while respecting human rights and social justice aspects. And what we see for the past years, when we look at European policies or federal and national policies, is that we are in constant incoherence 
it's it's like we have this goal, like the Green Deal, but constantly next to that, we keep on developing exactly the same policies in order to achieve this other goal, which is growth of GDP. And so now I think younger generation question the social target that we have, which is this constant growth, is this really going to allow us to reach our other goal, which is the Green Deal? And there we see that the incoherence constantly present in our policies, they raise really big questions. So this question of beyond growth is really present in the climate movement debates. Sandri, let's go here like, uh, about some of this uh, constant incoherence and same policies that are being implemented. So let's go into the whole uh, concept of limits to growth, mm. right? It was warning on the Earth resources would not be able to support the exponential rates of economic growth. And we're talking about 50 years ago, aren't we? So issue is not new, but the environment around this issue has profoundly changed, right? What's the take on this? Well, the environment's profoundly changed because we're in the midst of a poly crisis and we're feeling the tipping points that were actually demonstrated in some of the scenarios in our book that was published 50 years ago. So if we take that into consideration, we have to realize that we need to look at our impact today on the planetary boundaries, as has been said. And what does that actually mean? Well, first of all, GDP was never truly a measure of economic development. It measures productivity. It measures an extractive economy. And we've seen that that extractive economy has actually created the pandemic that we've just recently had, is creating the climate impacts that we have, and is also exacerbating poverty. Poverty and inequality means instability. So we both have polycrisis, plus we have growing instability across the globe in some of the richest countries, in the United States, for example. So looking at GDP as a measure of the way in which we really value economic development within natural resources is not possible in the 21st century. That is why we need to think about new indicators. And that's what we're going to be discussing next, about those new tools and new ways of looking at it. And to bring that on, uh, we're going to take a look here on the graphic illustration of some of the concepts that could help. This is the so-called donut economics and measuring progress towards an economy with a strong social foundation. You can see it on the screen now because this is another important thing, right, about the limits and what's there in the middle of that. This is So we're talking about the measuring progress towards an economy with strong uh, social foundation and broken ecological ceiling and all these factors is something of course that has to be there. Uh, Olivia, let's talk about this post-growth movement that has been growing as well for the decades and this is something that we can pick up on some of those aspects in response to this issue. What's your take on that? Well, I think the, the main challenge today is how to reconcile the requirement not to pass uh, the planetary boundaries on the one hand with indeed improving the well-being of all within society on the other hand. And one perhaps misleading feature from the donut mm. uh, representation is uh, it presents uh, both objectives as if there were a trade-off to be, to be made, as if there were a, a, a compromise to be struck between the two objectives. In fact, the two can be fully reconciled and are mutually supportive we can have a kind of development that creates jobs, particularly for um, low qualified workers um, to develop renewables energies, to uh, build social uh, public transport, uh, to invest in agroecological production. All these are labor intensive and create jobs. We can design measures that will make goods and services affordable for people living on low incomes. For example, if you insulate buildings, it means the electricity bills will, will uh, be lower. If you invest in public transport, it means you don't need an individual car to, to achieve mobility. And so we can have these measures that reduce our ecological footprint and at the same time create jobs and allow people to, le to live um, lives that are uh, more than decent, that are, that are flourishing. I think we have to realize that the post-growth society is not one based on sacrifice, it's not one based on us renouncing comfort, it's one that can be uh, based on solidarity, conviviality and indeed well-being. Philip Lombards, based on well-being and on the concept that this should not be a trade-off, it's about looking for the right balance. And yet, when it comes to the social effect, when it comes to jobs and how they would be affected, this is one of the big concerns for all of the Europeans and the policymakers here. 
Well, actually, I'm not sure that jobs is the, is the most crucial concern for people I'm talking with. Uh, what they are more concerned about are the prices of goods and services because, indeed, if you produce in a sustainable way, if you produce uh, in a just way in the sense of remunerating work properly, uh, obviously, products and services will be more expensive. It, if it were the opposite, the entire economy would be just and sustainable. It's the opposite. So, uh, the, the thing is then, OK, if, if basic goods and services are going to become more expensive, how do we make sure that everyone can afford them? Because, well, we need to eat, we need to live someplace, we need to wear clothes, we need to move. So are we not creating a, a dual class society? Well, by the way, that, that we are witnessing already today. Are we not making the problem worse? That, that is the, the whole issue of the just transition. How can the transition be just? And there, uh, I, I think Sandrine made the point uh, that taxation has a crucial role to play. Uh, if you really want wealth to be, and, and the benefits of this society to be distributed in a more equal way. That doesn't mean that uh, we should be in a communist system where basically it's one size fits all, but the degree of inequality that we are witnessing today, the degree of, how should I say, capital gains that is demanded by the machine, and that is by the individuals, the capital owners, are just incompatible with human life on this planet. So either uh, you change uh, the structure of the economy or this will drive humanity to its, uh, to its end. And so the question is, is, how do we make sure? I wouldn't say that we are leaving no one behind because, well, those capital owners can no longer enjoy the kind of profits that they are enjoying today. So, yes, they will be on the losing end of, of the equation and we should make no bones about that and no mystery about that. But how do we make sure that indeed, well, society as a whole can really move forward and enjoy the benefits of a good life. How is it that when, when you look in, in rich countries like France, you have so much dissatisfaction with work, with life, there must be something wrong, even though France is a rich country, right? So there must be something wrong in the system. The system delivers economic growth, but does not deliver well-being. But look, when it comes to such an important issue nowadays as the whole rise in the prices, how do you get the people and societies on board with the necessary changes when it comes to the short-term changes? How to convince? You, you need to show real willingness uh, to reduce inequality, even regardless of the green transition. I mean, uh, look at the Gilets jaunes in France. That, that was really striking. You have the collision of two, two policy decisions. The first policy decision is to abolish wealth tax. And the next policy decision is to increase diesel prices. How can this not explode, right? Just imagine the opposite. That prior to increasing uh, diesel prices, the government would have said, OK, we are going to increase taxes on capital gains and on capital stock, mm -hmm. right? Well, that would have been a very clear message that the government was intent on reducing inequality. And that would have made the effort more palatable. I don't say that it would have been easy, but one of the crucial ingredients of acceptability of reforms is justice. Adelaide, let's uh, touch upon this. When it comes to social justice and climate action, when it comes to the, uh, to the younger generation, we could see that these two movements have been specifically converging. How do the young Europeans look at that and how to, how to convince them and should we? I think three things. First, like Olivier already touched upon, yeah. uh, does economic growth actually today, right now, on the short term, support people that are actually having a hard time to finish their month? Does economic growth allow them in the short term to, to reach that? Honestly, I don't think that's happening right now. So short, short term, we can work with these different social movements to create and rethink our targets on an economical level. Second, looking at the different crises and emergency, like the climate emergency, we see that there is a huge inequality in who is contributing the most to the climate crisis and who is suffering the most from it. There, the inequality is there since more than 50 years ago, and it's just going to keep increasing. So there is also an inequality to, to raise. And lastly, I think it's important to still talk, to, to mention here that when we talk about beyond growth, it's really important that we're talking about certain countries in the world, certain economies that have gone away too far in their growth. I think it's very interesting when we look at uh, uh, academics like uh, Tim Jackson's who raised the point that you need growth 
to reach a sort, some, some type of uh, well-being. But this growth, at some point, it does, like, you, you cannot continue it non nonsensely without looking at some point that it doesn't keep this coherence with well-being. And this is where we are, for example, in most countries in the EU and in the West, where we, we want to keep going with growth, but we see it doesn't align to the growth of well-being anymore. So it's just important to state here that on the question of social justice internationally, we're not talking about every single country in the world. We're talking about Western countries who have already a achieved a certain well-being. And now, in the question of social justice and the historical responsibility, we need to question the way and the targets that we want to put on the table. Sandrine, how can we get to this level specifically, not in all the countries in the world, but let's talk Europe, let's talk the European Union. Yeah, let me build on what's just been said, because I think it's fascinating that we continue to think that somehow the economy is working as it's pushing growth. And it's not. As, as Aid has indicated, first of all, this is the first generation that is making less than its parents. We have the highest rates of suicide. We have the highest rates of mental illness. And we have people going in the streets suffering from energy poverty, not having access to affordable food and inflationary info. What we have done through our system dynamic modeling, based on the work of the Limits to Growth, but has continued actually over the last 50 years, is published a new report called Earth for All, a Survival Guide for Humanity. And within that report, we have looked at the index between actually social tipping points and well-being and wealth. And we've seen that in our well-being index, wealth has gone up and actually well-being has dramatically plummeted in the wealthiest countries. So that inequality gap is only growing, which means that the economy that we have today is first of all over-financialized. It's only giving profits to the few, and in particular to a few shareholders. It is not servicing the real economy and people's lives and livelihoods. So how do we redress that balance? What we talk about in Earth for All, a survival guide for humanity is we say there are five key turnarounds in order to get there. You have to deal with poverty, inequality, empowerment, in particular girls and women across the globe who can have access to education, be part of decision making, and then energy and food as the basic underbelly of making and allowing us to survive and thrive. And lastly, we need to start taxing the wealthiest portion of our economy properly. That means that we need to stop the windfall profits that we've seen that have been absolutely huge for the fossil energy companies. We need to tax those and we need to properly redistribute. And I agree with Philippe, this is not some kind of communistic state. This is about a much more egalitarian state that enables actually people to innovate, but also for communities to thrive and not just survive. And we have to be careful. Continued instability, not taking into consideration the poorest citizens in Europe, will mean that we will see a real insecure situation across Europe from a political perspective. Let's talk about some of the practical tools and examples of something that has been done and can be done now in the short term specifically, of course, because we have this growth of populism and other forces. Philip? Well, the basic principle is what you measure is what you get. So we should start measuring stuff that really matters. Uh, okay, uh, Sandrine mentioned agriculture. It's not that we are enabling industrial ag agriculture, we are inciting it at the expense of every other model. Mm -hmm. Now, we could start measuring not production, but soil quality. We could start measuring, uh, uh, so natural productivity, which could start measuring the use or reduction of use of pesticides and herbicides. And when you put in, in place those measures and you give yourself targets, basically you force yourself to go into a more virtuous direction. Now, interestingly, this is something that the Commission has, uh, has uh, hinted at and, and indicated with a farm to force strategy. And guess what? There's enormous, enormous, enormous resistance because this hits vested interests. Because indeed, industrial farming does not benefit the planet, but does benefit uh, owners of that system. And they don't want to surrender their, their power and, their, and their, their profits. And this is where we need political courage. Actually, most of the instruments we need 
Ah no, we don't know everything. I, I could not give you the blueprint of a sustainable economy, but quite a lot of work has been done. And never forget that the current economic system was not on the shelf and then we implemented it. It's a social construct and a post beyond growth economy will be a social construct as well. But many instruments are on the table. What is lacking is the political will to go against vested interest. That is what is still lacking, I would say, in the European policymaking bubble. Olivier. No, I, I think the fight against poverty and the reduction of inequalities have been built until now on a very simple idea that has been dominating particularly the, the 30 years of strong economic growth in Europe in the years 1945, 1975. And that is, you grow the economy and then you redistribute in part to the shareholders, to the corporations, in part to the workers, uh, increased wages as a result of productivity gains, and in part, uh, finally, to, uh, to the state in the form of taxation and social contributions. And this idea that poverty could be reduced by growing the economy and then redistributing its uh, benefits is now entirely passé. We need to think about different ways of combating poverty, and that is to build an inclusive economy that provides uh, to each individual his or her ability to, to, to thrive. Uh, and that can be done by reducing working time, by providing a job guarantee, uh, allowing people uh, who are long-term unemployed to have access to jobs. It can be done by investing in labor-intensive um, um, measures that contribute to the ecological transition. And actually, for the United Nations, I provided a, a report on Building Back Better in October 2020, listing all the measures in areas such as food and agriculture, energy, mobility, housing, building, that have this triple dividend, creating jobs, allowing access to goods and services at an affordable price for low-income uh, consumers, households, and, and finally um, reducing our impacts on the environment, our use of resources, and, and, and the pollution and waste we, we create. So we can design a, 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 an ecological transformation that also benefits the people. And that will not be perceived as a threat, as a, as a lowering of living standards, but instead can be much more um, a source of social cohesion and, and a reduction of poverty and inequalities. And I think that is, that is really key. Uh, Adelaide, what is it that young people can do when it comes to making those changes coming sooner rather than later? Younger people have started to mobilize. They have, at least for a part of it, they have started to engage. Don't forget that we have grown into this world. We don't know anything else than the system that we are in right now. And this is what our education has taught us to do. And today, still in school, in university, this is the only thing that we teach us. So I think younger citizens, they need to be critical on what we learn also at school. Everyone studying economics. Do you really think this is how we're going to be able to solve these different crises that we're facing? And I think we have to question our professors. But then we also need to keep learning from other academics that bring forward alternatives. You were talking about solutions that can be put next to uh, GDP or to put away GDP. There are so many academics working on that. And it's so interesting to reach them, to, to understand and, and read their work. And I think that's, the, that's part of the of our role as younger generation to first continue to learn about alternatives but also mobilize around that and organize ourselves. We are already citizens. We, are, we, we, we need to be part of this process. We need to be around the table. It, it looks so big and so intense and so like not reachable for younger people because it is a hard topic. But it doesn't matter because we are part, we need to be part of this discussion because we are going to be affected. We are already affected. And so I think we need to just make sure and remind younger people that we are legitimate. Whatever the debate is, it, because it touches us, we are legitimate to be around the table and share our views and opinions. So to all younger people, let's continue to learn and mobilize and organize ourselves to be around the table and around the discussion. Thank you so much for everybody for participating in this debate. Uh, the Beyond the Growth 2 2023 conference is a multi-stakeholder event aiming to discuss and co-create policies for sustainable prosperity in Europe. Don't miss it. It is taking place from the 15th to the 17th of May in the European Parliament here in Brussels. Now there are more than 2,000 uh, participants already registered here offline to participate. Do register online and there is the link that you could see on your screens now. You can still join the conference online. Thank you so much. Pleasure.
Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.